If you are pregnant or you've recently had a baby, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Kath Bequee, a physiotherapist working in women's health and mum of three. Inside my online program, Fitness Mama, I just love helping support women to care for their bodies during pregnancy, prepare their bodies for birth and support their after birth recovery, helping them feel confident and strong inside out during this important stage of their lives. In this podcast, join me each week as we dive into all things pregnancy care, childbirth and postnatal recovery, helping you through every step of the journey. It is absolutely possible to feel amazing and confident in our bodies during this motherhood journey, and I want that for you. Come and say hi to me on Instagram at fitnessmama, and let's dive into today's episode. Welcome back to the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. Today's podcast episode is for you if you have gestational diabetes. Or perhaps you know someone with gestational diabetes and you think they might benefit from listening to this episode. Flick it to them. (laughs) Share the love. So today's episode is a rerun from when I was interviewed for the Gestational Diabetes Club podcast. Helena is a beautiful dietitian and I will link her podcast in the show notes. So if you, especially if you have gestational diabetes, go and check out her brilliant podcast, The link is in the show notes, um, and she's got lots of great episodes. So in today's episode, we discuss safe exercise for gestational diabetes. We discuss why movement is so important for pregnancy in general, as, as well as for those who have gestational diabetes. And we talk about the type of exercise um, that is best for women with gestational diabetes. We talk about how exercise affects blood sugar levels. We talk about the best time of day to exercise for women with gestational diabetes. And there's also some tips in there for exercising when you're feeling nauseous or sick or achy or sore. So those sort of real life practical examples. So if you've got gestational diabetes, you're going to love this episode. Before I do dive into this episode, I would love to invite you to join us inside Fitness Mama. If you would like to be able to help to control your blood sugar levels with easy access quality workouts that you can do from the comfort of your home, then come and join us for a free seven-day trial. Perhaps you found you're not exercising as much as you'd like to. Uh, Perhaps you're busy, you've lost motivation, or you're not sure about the best way to be looking after your body. Perhaps you've got pelvic girdle pain or gestational diabetes or abdominal muscle separation and you're not sure about the best exercises for you. Or perhaps you even want to get back into running after birth and you want the best Kickstarter possible. Then Fitness Mama could be just what you're looking for. Join us for these convenient, short, easy workouts that you can do from the comfort of your home whilst your bubba kicks around next to you or whilst your toddler runs around or at the end of a long day at work. Head to fitnessmama.com. There's a free seven-day trial and the link is in the show notes. Right, let's dive into this episode with Helena. Welcome, Kat. Very excited. Tell us who you are. So I just read out a little bit, but tell us in your own words, who are you? What do you do? Why do you do what you do? Tell us all of it. Oh, thanks, Helena, for having me on your lovely podcast. It's an absolute honor to chat. Yeah, so I think you gave a bit of a wrap up, but I am a mum of three. I am a physiotherapist and I really found myself in this area because I would keep seeing women in the clinic and like I still do work clinically, but I would see women when they had the issues with aches and pains or they had the concerns about the pelvic floor. And I felt it was very reactive being in the clinic and it's a, it's an important role to help with the treatment. But I, I started to branch more into this more preventative aspect. Like there's so much that we can be doing preventatively during pregnancy and postpartum to help potentially reduce your risk of aches and pains and, you know, pelvic floor concerns and all the things that come with having a baby. Like our bodies go through an absolute transformation with pregnancy and childbirth. 
doesn't matter what type of birth you end up having. And I think to be able to support the body and be proactive for me is always a no-brainer over being more reactive and treating. I couldn't agree more. I love that. Proactive is a word I use a lot actually because why do we need to wait for there to be a problem before we start doing things to actively work towards improving our health outcomes and, you know, reducing our chance of having those things. Like you said, like the aches and pains and all that stuff, fun stuff that can come along with pregnancy and preparing you for feeling really well after birth as well. Let's get into some of the questions that I have for you. Tell us why movement is really important during pregnancy, just in general. Yeah. There's so many beautiful benefits to exercising during pregnancy. And I think probably most people know them all. Like it's whether or not you're pregnant or you've got gestational diabetes or whether you are an athlete or you've never exercised, you know, in your life. It doesn't matter where you are. There's so many benefits to be gained from regular exercise during pregnancy. And I think these are being researched and, you know, there's research to show this more and more too. So it's not just a, an assumed assumption. Like we all assume and hope that exercise is beneficial, but there's actually good solid research supporting this more and more, which is exciting. So these benefits might include just general medical benefits like lower blood pressure, you know, as you know, reduced risk of gestational diabetes, prevention of excessive weight gain, blood pressure complications. And this is the physical side of things, let alone the mental health side of things. Like there's such a huge correlation between mental health and physical health. We know that like low impact exercise reduces the risk of preeclampsia. We know that there's a postpartum benefits too for both mum and baby. So I think we could just keep on singing Mm -hmm. the praises. Um, I think the difficulty is when, you know, we all know the benefits of exercise, but anyone who's pregnant knows that you suddenly become pregnant, you might be feeling exhausted, you might be feeling nauseous, you might develop aches and pains, you're time poor, you might have another toddler that you're running around after. So I think that's when reality sets in and that's, I guess, more the issue oh, yeah. in my eyes. Totally, totally, totally the same as, um, you know, we all know eating fruits and vegetables is healthy but it's actually doing it that can be really, really, really challenging because there's so many barriers just in day-to-day life. I completely agree with you. I think there's never usually an education problem, right? I mean, sometimes there is, sometimes there's some gaps in knowledge, but a lot of the time it is actually having the tools and strategies to be able to apply this stuff to your own life. So yeah, I think that that's a really good point. So you know, alongside just the life stuff, are there other reasons that somebody might have um, exercise restricted during pregnancy? Oh, so a lot of the women that end up joining my program, Fitness Mama, do so because, like, as we, as we just said, they are struggling to leave the house with a the toddler. Um, they find, you know, the act of getting in a car, driving 10, 15 minutes to the local Pilates place, doing a 45 or 60 minute class, driving home again, like, suddenly that's nearly two hours gone from your day. Whereas um, being able to exercise, and I know I'm biased, but 15 minutes in your lounge room with your toddler next to you, it's like it's so good. So apart from that obvious lifestyle um, aspect, women with pelvic girdle pain, I see a lot of them inside my program because they're finding it hard. Like if you've got pelvic girdle pain which or back pain, which unfortunately is a huge a huge thing with pregnancy. Like there's some research articles vary, but anywhere between 25% to 75% of pregnant women have some type of aches or pains. So that's three out of every four women listening are probably achy or sore. Um, and that will probably rule out walking, which is unfortunate because walking, I say, is an amazing exercise. It's free. It gets you out in the fresh air. It's low impact. It's all the, you know, it, it ticks all the boxes in terms of pregnancy exercise, except unfortunately it can flare up, like the bi- biomechanical nature of it, it can flare up pelvic girdle pain, which is unfortunate because we need to be able to walk, you know. <laughs> we need to be able to walk. We all walk every day. Um, but in terms of doing walking as an additional form of exercise to your everyday 
that can pose a huge problem. And I think that's when instead of stopping the walking, we need to substitute that with a pelvic girdle pain friendly mode of exercise is super important. Um, some other restrictions to exercise. I think, I think they're probably the biggest two, along with the nauseousness, the fatigue. So it's mainly the lifestyle factors that we talked about and the pain factors. Is it ever appropriate for a doctor to have put somebody on essentially like bed rest during their pregnancy? Because sometimes, you know, I hear that and I'm actually never sure because I know that a lot of the time like research moves along and we become more progressive and that, you know, movement seems to be beneficial in a lot of cases. But are there actually reasons where you might be totally restricted from doing anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And again, this is branching not into my area of expertise. This is really Mm. the medical side of things. But there are certain complications such as preeclampsia, um, placental issues, preterm labour, you know, if they've got concerns about ruptured membranes, um, cervical insufficiency, multiple pregnancies, you know, if you've got twins or triplets and want to avoid the risk of premature labour. Look, I do, as you said, I'm not sure where research is at. It's a really hard area to research. You know, you yeah. can't exactly do a randomised controlled trial and say, hey, you both got cervical insufficiency. Let's get you guys exercising and let's get, you know, this group exercising and this group not exercising in a randomized controlled trial. Like you just can't do that. So I think safety for baby and mum is always paramount and it will be a very hard thing to research in the future. And exercise in pregnancy in general is really hard to research, let alone if there's those medical complications. So um, I, look, I do say to a lot of my mums, like, yes, there are so many benefits to exercising during pregnancy, but if you are given these restrictions, you know, you've got the rest of your life like, to get fit and strong again. Like it's, it is not the be all and end all if you are on bed rest for, and I, I think in my whole career of being a women's health physio, I've only known one or two women max out of the hundreds and hundreds that have been on bed rest. So it is, it is very rare. I, I, I've only really come across it when I've been in working in the hospital system because they generally need that hospital like monitoring. So yeah, if you're listening, don't be too concerned about that. Absolutely go and check with your provider. Make sure you are cleared to exercise during pregnancy. But yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally, totally answers it. Um, It's hard for the doctors too. Let's say you've got a pregnant woman in front of you who's got a certain medical complication. Sure, she might be fine to exercise, but research can't tell us either way. And you would not want to say go and exercise if there is this potential risk that baby or her could be harmed. Some of these medical conditions are serious and I think need to be, yeah, so... Again, that's not really my area of expertise. So if in doubt, anyone listening, <laughs> go and, and that's all that I always say at the start of every single workout, do make sure you've got the medical clearance to exercise because there are some conditions which I'm not, like I'm not a doctor, so it, I leave that to the medical world. Totally, totally. Um, now we talked about how certain exercises like walking is probably not the best go-to because for a lot of people that's going to cause some issues. So what types of movement would you recommend instead? And double-barreled question here, but you also mentioned that, you know, doing something like 15 minutes of whatever, like in your lounge room while your toddler's there as well is an option. Like, do you still get the same amount of benefit from doing something like that? Mm. Finally, you ask this question. There is some really recent research, which I have to say there are some, look, this research, um, I think it's, it's not, it's not a Cochrane review. It's not, it's a randomized controlled trial, but there are some questions in this research article. But the exciting thing is, and this is, I've got it up here in April, 2023. So hot off the press, a randomized controlled trial they randomized women with gestational diabetes into two groups. One of them, one of the groups completed short walks, a short 10 minute walk after each meal. 
Mm-hmm. And then another, the other group of women did one longer walk, so 30 minute walk outside of that one hour of eating time. Does that make sense? So some of the women did short 10 minute walks immediately after eating and others did a longer walk. And they found that there was in a, tw- I think it was a 24 hour, like everyone, I can leave you the link for this article if you want. Yes, so please. Don't quote me on this, but they found that there were no differences between the groups of exercise on blood glucose control. So I think that, it, again, it's just a snippet, like it's just one research article, but we are still, what I'm trying to say is research is not conclusive in terms of the actual dosage for um, gestational diabetes. But there is thought that perhaps 10 minutes of exercise after a meal is just as effective as one longest stint of exercise. So for some women, they might think, that's brilliant. I can easily go for a 10-minute walk after a meal. But for other women, they might think, oh, that's impossible. I've got a family. You know, I can't go for it. I prefer to do one bigger chunk of exercise once in the day rather than doing three small chunks. So I think, again, what we were talking about at the start, ultimately the best type of exercise you can do is something that fits in with your lifestyle that you can do consistently. Mm. You know, it's all well and good to be signed up to your local gym and go once a week for an hour. But if you can actually do something a bit more consistent from the comfort of your home or whatever works in with your you, your lifestyle, aches and pains, nauseousness, fatigue levels, children, like that's what's going to have the most benefit um, in terms of your Pregnant, the exercise benefits that we're talking about, whether or not that's gestational diabetes control or improving your mental health or, you know, weight control, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Give us some examples. Examples of exercise, types of movement. Types of movement. Oh, so we've got walking, beautiful. Pelvic girdle pain, probably not the best. So if that's the case, maybe pop in, get in the water, walk in the water because when you move in water, you've got a lot less weight going through your joints. But again, walking in water, I love doing that um, with my first pregnancy, with my second pregnancy. When my daughter was at childcare, I'd go to the pool. When it got to my third pregnancy, there was no chance like I could take that time out to go to the pool. Um, So, but swimming, again, beautiful. Um, But with swimming, being aware of breast Stroke can sometimes flare up pelvic girdle pain. So freestyle might be more comfortable um, or swimming with a pool boy in between your knees, one of those little, you know, flotation devices. And then we've got Pilates, and which I love. That works on those core muscles. You know what, ladies, if you're listening, one in three of you probably going to have some type of leaking as a result of childbirth. So accidentally leaking when you sneeze, cough, laugh, move. Um, One and two of you might will probably have some degree of prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse, according to the Australian Continence Foundation. So these stats are real. And I, I, you can imagine the baby growing in your body is affecting your pelvic floor, it affects your abdominal muscles, it affects your foundation. So I, I, again, I'm biased, but Research shows that we need to look after our pelvic floor and core during pregnancy. So if you could combine a walking program with a Pilates-based core, you know, involving strength, we know strength works really great, especially with gestational diabetes, um, with some strength and core work, that is a really great combination. I don't think walking is enough during pregnancy. I think we need to complement that with something that has those additional benefits to your body. Mm-hmm. Is that enough of an example? I could keep going. Yeah. That's a really good example, I think. And it does help put it in context as well, because I think a lot of those things are things that you can do at home as well, like in terms of doing Pilates and some of the strength-based stuff. Like, do you need to have, um, if you're doing resistance training as well, actually, do you need to have really heavy weights or is it okay if you have like some home-based things? Oh, no, absolutely. All workouts inside Fitness Mama are strength workouts they all use body weight resistance. Mm. So um, whether or not that's, you know, squats, push-ups, tricep dips, and in all the workouts inside my program, 
there's different types of workouts depending on how you're feeling. There's that workouts which are perfect for aches and pains. You've got the strength ones. You've got cardio. But with the strength, I generally use what is around the house. You know, you don't need to go and buy fancy or expensive equipment, whether or not that's water bottles, bottles of wine. Um, there's a lot that you can use around the house for resistance exercise. That's so good to know. It makes it so much more practical, doesn't it? That's actually amazing. I'm really glad that you said that because I, I know that a lot of the time when I'm talking with people, I'm encouraging things like, you know, just do something like at home. It doesn't have to be a whole thing of like getting to the gym or doing like a, I don't know, a whole like 60 minute swim or whatever it's going to be. So that's actually amazing to know that you support that as well, that in terms of just being at home, using what you have around, being resourceful like that, it doesn't have to be this huge undertaking and we can simplify it in our brains a little bit and just bring it back to basics. Like what have you got around the house? Just use your own body weight. I love that approach. Mm. And my members have been asking more and more, like all women, we're all so time poor. Like it's just, you know, I think it's day and age, um, post-COVID, everyone just seems so busy. And the most popular workouts in my membership are the three-minute workouts. And you still get benefits from three minutes. You know, you're still working those muscles. Um, It's still helping to control all those hormones, like the hormones which are important for your insulin control and improving those endorphins, those feel-good hormones. Like you can do a lot in three minutes. So I think, again, research needs to catch up. Um, But, yeah, it's exciting that either short bursts or long bursts might potentially have the same benefit. So let's work out what works best for you and your lifestyle and make it simple. Simple is good. Yeah, that's a really cool approach. Um, And I want to dive into gestational diabetes a little bit more in a second because I'm really interested in that research. I also think that on that note of having just those really small bursts, that's again, I'm, and I've got to caveat this, like when I'm suggesting these things to people, I'm not giving any specific recommendations around exercise, but I often encourage things like, okay, can we just carve out like five, 10 minutes of structured time in your day where you do deliberately go and do some type of movement? Don't care what it is. Don't care if you just go and like lie down on a yoga mat for a bit. But I think there's also something to be said about actually creating that window of time for yourself where potentially you can then build on that in the future because maybe you can do three minutes, five minutes, and then the next time you might feel like, oh, well, that was actually dead easy that I could do five minutes twice a week. So I could probably do it like four times a week or I could do 10 minutes instead of two minutes because like we just naturally start to feel good about ourselves if we know that we can achieve that really small goal. So I think that, you know, as well as there being physiological benefits, there's also that like mental benefit as well in terms of being able to just really build on that. And, you know, that's how we create habits, right? We start Mm. small and keep going. And it's three minutes more than if you'd done zero minutes. So absolutely. You just totally nailed it. It's building the habit. And if you yeah. can build the habit, you're you're bound for success in no matter what area of life, you know, <laughs> exercise and confidence. or relationships or work. Like it's habit, um, atomic habits. Have you read that? I haven't read it. A lot of people have said that they've read it and that I should read it. So I might read it one day. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also building up your confidence as well, right? And, you know, as well, like if you feel quite intimidated by gym equipment and things like that, just go and be in the environment for a bit. You don't have to do anything. Just go and, like I said, sit on the mat and then, you know, you're safe. You got this. Like you've done it once. You can probably go and do a little bit more there. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Um, I've got so many ways that I could take this, but before we get big into GD, I wanted to ask, cause I know that I've had this specific question from people before, like, if you already do lift like heavier weights, so I know we just, you know, sung all the praises of not doing that. But if you do before you get pregnant or you do high intensity stuff and running and things like that, do you have to stop it? If you're fit and strong and active during pregnancy, the general guidelines is that you can continue what you were doing. You know, for someone who is a marathon runner, 
their pregnancy exercise is going to look very different to a person who has never really done any structured exercise in their life. Um, I think there's general guidelines, which I think should be adapted for everyone with pregnancy. But in terms of what specific exercises you do is going to vary a lot depending on what you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So the types, whether or not you are into high intensity exercise or you're you have no, you've never done a structured workout in your life. The general guidelines are recommended. You don't want to overheat, um, especially in that first trimester. So whether or not you're going for, you know, a high intensity workout or you're going for your first ever walk, make sure you're not overheating. So especially if it's hot or that, so that's one big um, recommendation. The other one is we want to be able to, have you heard of the talk test before? I have. Yeah, the moderate intensity exercise. So (laughs) we want to exercise in a way where we can still hold a conversation. So you don't want to be gasping for air. But for a marathon runner, for them to go for a five-kilometer run during pregnancy might be a walk in the park and they can hold a conversation, the whole five kilometers. Whereas you know, if you've got someone else that goes for their first five kilometer run, they'll be huffing and puffing and unable and gasping for air. So that's a really nice um, general recommendation for exercise. And the other one is no exercise on their, on your back after the first trimester. Um, and now again, guidelines do vary depending on which publication you're looking at. There's unfortunately, there's no consistency in terms of this guideline. Some of them say don't exercise at all on your back. Others say it's fine until you're 30 weeks pregnant. Um, but I have been going by the RANSCOG, the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecology. At the moment, they don't recommend any exercise on the back after the first trimester. And that is because there has, they thought that the baby, when you're lying on your back, the baby pushes down on the blood vessels that supply the baby. So you might be feel fine when you're exercising on your back, but there's potentially less blood flow going to your baby. So we want to avoid that. Yeah, okay. Interesting, interesting. Um, and sorry if I'm making you repeat yourself, but like but if you let's say you're a power lifter, can you keep doing things like that? Or is there danger in that? Well, if you're a power lifter and you can still hold a conversation. Um, another one, we want to protect your pelvic floor and core during this stage. So if you're having to brace and, you know, do the full Valsalva movement, which potentially pushes down on your pelvic floor while you're doing the power movement, then I'd say maybe we need to reduce the, um, the weight a little bit so that you're not putting that excessive pressure through your pelvic floor. Um, so make sure you can breathe through the movement. So that's a big one is if you can breathe through the movement, you're not having to hold your breath and bear down, then that's ideal. Again, I do just want to say research is a bit iffy about this. So, you know, I, what I'm saying now might change as more research comes to light. But again, it's what we were saying before. You know, if you're a power lifter, like if there's an element of unknown, do you want to risk your mm. pelvic floor and potential continence down the track or do you want to just back off a little bit? I'm not saying don't power lift but just back off the weight a little bit to potentially protect your pelvic floor so that you can get back into power lifting as quickly as possible after birth. Yeah, um, very true. Yeah, so I'm – but I know everyone's different and everyone's got – um different priorities and passions and so I I don't love saying yes or no to anyone I like to work with them and their goals and try to adapt whatever exercise they want to do in a way that they're happy and that's good for them and baby today's episode is brought to you by baby jogger making parents lives easier For active families, Baby Jogger will be your go-to. Their strollers are designed with your comfort and convenience in mind, allowing you to embrace the joys of parenthood while staying active. 
With Baby Jogger's well-known quick fold technology, you can effortlessly fold your stroller with just one hand, making it a breeze to store and transport. We know that every family has different needs and Baby Jogger has you covered. They offer a wide range of lightweight, compact options from single to double strollers to all-terrain models. No matter your lifestyle, you'll find the perfect fit. Whether you're navigating through busy streets or tackling rough terrains, their strollers provide a smooth and enjoyable ride for both you and your little ones. And let's not forget about growing families. Whether you're expecting another child or planning for the future, Baby Jogger is there every step of the way. To learn more about their incredible strollers and find the perfect fit for your family, visit their website today on babyjogger.com.au and use the code FIT20, that's F-I-T-20, for 20% of any full-priced product from Baby Jogger. I've definitely said before on this podcast, but I think um, the mark of a solid health professional is always somebody that will give you an answer that's like, Mm, maybe it depends. <laughs> it can be annoying as the listener yeah. or as, you know, the person asking yeah. the question, but even, there's always yeah. gray area. And even powerlifting, like what is powerlifting? That could be so yeah. many different types of exercise and intensities and yeah. So yeah. there's no one size fits all, that's for sure. Love it. Um, all right, let's talk about GD because I know that that is where lots of you have questions and where I'm really interested in to talk a little bit more. Thanks for bringing that study to us before. And if you can let me know what that is, I'm going to have a good read and we're going to put that in the show notes because I think that's the first cool takeaway that we've got here that we can potentially do short bursts and we can do longer form exercise and get equal benefits in terms of blood sugar levels. And you've also outlined that doing exercise in general can help reduce risk of gestational diabetes and it can help with the management of it. But talk to us about how it specifically affects blood sugar levels. What's actually going on in the body? Mm. Well, I think you mentioned a few of them. So exercise helps well the thought is exercise helps to control blood sugar levels by using glucose for energy. So when we exercise, our muscles require energy and this energy is provided by glucose. So as a result, exercise helps to lower blood sugar levels or glucose levels and improve overall glucose metabolism. Does that make sense? So that's a big one. The secondly, hormone regulation, I think we've talked about. So um, exercise does help with the release of various hormones in the body. It can help to balance hormone levels, including insulin, we've got cortisol, those feel-good hormones that we talked about, and they can help to contribute to better blood glucose control yeah. and reduce gestational diabetes. Um, and then we've got the more general benefits where I, that includes weight management, um, the increased cardiovascular fitness, you know, stress reduction, mental health, um, what else? Mm. Um, I, I think exercise can also improve insulin sensitivity. So what that means is that your body can use insulin more effectively to regulate your blood glucose levels. So yeah, yeah, I think there's some of those nice, um, yeah, there's a lot of those beautiful benefits in terms of helping women with gestational diabetes. Yeah, it's pretty special. I think that those, you know, two of those things are really key in the sense that um, doing exercise can independently move sugar out of your bloodstream without insulin, which is number one, really cool. And then number two, it can make your insulin work better. So you get that dual effect. And now you correct me if I'm wrong, but I also believe that doing exercise has a longer lasting effect than just that duration, right? So we get an effect on blood sugar for hours afterwards is my understanding. So my next question, does the type or intensity or duration of your exercise affect the blood sugar differently? Well, again, I, I, from what I'm aware, I don't believe the guidelines change for normal pregnancy versus if you've got gestational diabetes. So in terms of the intensity and type, it is the same currently, the guidelines whether or not you have pregnancy, or whether or not you're pregnancy or you whether or not you're pregnant or you've got gestational diabetes. So 
So for example, we talked about, we recommend moderate intensity. So that's that exercise at a level where you can have a conversation. So um, you're not huffing and you're not puffing. And yeah, so you're not too short of breath. Mm -hmm. So that moderate intensity is for all pregnant women and it it doesn't change if you've got gestational Mm -hmm. diabetes. Um, And then the duration we've talked about in terms of short bursts versus a longer burst, the jury is still out in terms of research. And my take is that let's do something that works for you and your lifestyle so that you can build up that consistency. So I think you've given us like a lot to think about just in terms of gestational diabetes. And my main takeaway here is that it doesn't necessarily, in terms of exercise, make you any different to somebody who doesn't have gestational diabetes. The recommendations are still the same and we don't know exactly how much exercise you should be doing. We don't know if there's specific times that you should be doing exercise that's going to support your blood sugar better than doing it at other times. We don't know if there's specific durations and in terms of intensity, the recommendation for everybody sounds like it is to do that moderate intensity where we're not getting heart rate up too much and not getting out of breath and unable to maintain a conversation. So would you say that that is kind of a good summary about that? Yeah, absolutely. I do just want to say, I know I brought up that recent research article, but I do think that that's um, that's just one article. And generally, like if you go to the Diabetes Australia website, the general recommendation is that research has been shown that doing some exercise after meals can help women mm-hmm. with gestational diabetes hit their recommended target blood glucose levels more often. So with that, that in mind, that is a general recommendation still. And I think we do also just need to acknowledge that that is challenging for mums, um, whether or not it's because it's dark and cold at the end, you know, it's might be winter after dinner, it's dark outside. You don't want to be walking, you know, by yourself. Um, or maybe it's, you've got, you're working full time and you've got toddlers and yeah. So I do just, I want to just bring that awareness that that's where being adaptable in terms of finding someone that you trust to help give you an exercise program that works with you and your lifestyle, I think is ultimately the most important thing here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, like you've said as well, the best exercise is the exercise that works for you and that you enjoy. You've got to enjoy it too, right? And Maybe as well, you can just give us a bit of an idea about whether there are specific types of exercises that can prepare people best going into birth. And then, you know, some of that stuff around the postpartum period, like when can you exercise again? And, you know, do you keep doing the same things? Are the recommendations the same during pregnancy as in the postpartum phase? Like what what is the <laughs> guideline there? Okay, we could cut it right here and go into a second podcast episode. Yeah. And I love this question, but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. So in terms of preparing the body for birth, we know, and so this is putting gestational diabetes aside, for pregnant women, we know that pelvic floor exercises can help to reduce your risk of leaking of pelvic floor issues in that early postpartum period. We also know that pelvic floor relaxation and um, perineal massage and preparing the pelvic floor for birth can help reduce risk of third and fourth degree perineal tears and episiotomy. So from that third trimester specifically, I think this is something that needs to, you know, until now we might have been doing great pregnancy exercise and a range of walking and cardio and strength. But when we're getting into our third trimester, this is a time when I think it would be advantageous to think, okay, what type of birth am I after? And if you're after a vaginal birth, how do I prepare my pelvic floor for birth? You know, do I need to include my pelvic floor exercises, pelvic floor relaxation exercises, perineal massage from 36 weeks onwards? Um, Because there's some nice research showing the benefits. And then once you've had your baby, 
I've got a whole podcast on six tips to help with your afterbirth recovery in those first six weeks. So it's, I think, generally, we say lots of rest and gently build up your walking in those first six weeks. Get started with your pelvic floor exercises gently and slowly and build that up six weeks. Once you get to that six-week mark, it's like the magic number, but that's generally when you had that doctor's review, you check medically, it's all happening, you know, all working well. And then you might start more structured program. So, but I think in that first six weeks postpartum, that's heaps. That's when you're sleep deprived. You're learning how to care for a new baby. You know, you're up all night breastfeeding. So to just work on gradually building up the walking. So five minutes extra every week, I recommend. So five minute bursts in that first week. So around the hospital, around the house. Um, the second week, you might do 10 minute bursts and you might intersperse that with beautiful horizontal rest. Horizontal rest helps to take that pressure off the pelvic floor. That downward pressure that comes with sitting and standing. Our pelvic floor stretches 300% during childbirth. We, and it's like an elastic band that's stretched and we want that natural recoil to occur as much as possible. You could be the strongest woman in the world, but if you just had a vaginal birth, everything's stretched. Mus muscle, fascia, connective tissue. You know, when you eat a piece of steak, it's not all the red meat. You've got all the white bits of mm -hmm. sinew and that's what's stretched. And we can't, we can't hasten that recovery. We want that recoil to occur like a rubber band so that that knitting together of the soft tissue structures occurs. And for that, we need to that's where rest is best. And I am, and every child I had, I recognized this more and more. Like I did way too much for my first, after my first baby. I was wanting to get back into walking and exercise and, you know, pretend like I hadn't had a baby. I, this baby's not going to stop me sort of situation. But then when it came to my third baby, I really, I guess I had to, um, What's the word? I just had to like surrender uh, a bit. Surrender. And Absolutely. Trust the process. Yes. I did. And, you know, I had to rest. Like it was almost forced rest. I, I just physically could not leave the house with three children. Um, and I have to say that was my best recovery of all three was when I did surrender to the process and I allowed my body that healing time. So my biggest tip would be to, for the postpartum recovery, Allow your body healing time, but do clever exercise to support your body um, in that first six-week period. And then from six weeks onwards, like your postnatal postnatal rehab plan, what is it? How are you going to reinvest back into your body so that you can get back to doing what you love? You know, yeah. um, after having a knee reconstruction on the footy field, these sports players are all doing rehab. After a hip replacement, everyone's doing rehab. But for some reason, after having a baby, I remember at my six-week checkup, my doctor said, you know, my body felt so different. It felt so foreign. It was just, I felt like a different person, like physically. And my doctor said, cool, you're, you're healing well. I'll see you next pregnancy. And, you know, from six months onwards, I'll see you next time round. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, like, what that? Is that it? <laughs> so um, postnatal rehab. <laughs> Get on into it. It doesn't have to be fancy. You know, this is stuff that I help inside Fitness Mama. It doesn't need to be time consuming. It's the same thing as what we've been talking about. What works for you? What works for your lifestyle? What will help to build your body back up again to help you achieve your fitness, weight, confidence, goals, all the rest? Yeah. And I think even long term, like I'm always um, out here for the gestational diabetes ladies as well, thinking about your futures in terms of having an elevated risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Like we can't beat around the bush with those things. Like those risk factors are there. And we know that movement is also one of the best things that you can do consistently to help reduce that risk. So please, please at your six week check, you've got to do your oral glucose tolerance test again. You've got to do it. Please don't put it off. We need to know what's going on with your blood sugar. It's always better to be safe than sorry. And it's a really good time to, you know, link back in with somebody that can support you in terms of all of that 
movement and recovery and then yeah finding out like what routine is going to work best for you so I I really like that approach as well so in terms of that six weeks trust the process like let your body do its thing relax recover in terms of your nutrition definitely eat those foods that were on your like oh I probably won't have those right now in terms of my blood sugar eat those delicious foods celebrate yourself a little bit but then it's so important to get back into this amazing routine that I know that so many of you are in being so proactive about managing your blood sugar and your gestational diabetes. Don't let that go out the window. Be an amazing role model for your family and do the best thing that you can to keep supporting your health and get that quality of life as well, because you want to be able to run around with your kids. And, you know, people say that all the time. It's very stereotypical and cliche, but you know, it's true. We want to be able to do those things. You want to be able to move well, feel confident in your body, feel like your body is yours and not feel like you just have completely lost yourself. Right. So that's so important. And I think we're absolutely talking the same language here, which is cool. Um, what are your favorite exercises in that? Especially like as a mom, like what were your favorite things to start getting back into after you'd had your babies? Oh, look, walking is unparalleled, you know, getting out with your baby, going for a morning yeah. walk, if it, even if it's, you know, five-minute burst, 10-minute burst, 15, um, fresh air, get some sunshine, walk to the local cafe. True. Gotta love walking. It's free. But, again, I, and I know I'm biased, but I think it's for good reason. Like we all need to work on our weakest link. And whether or not you've had a vaginal birth or a cesarean, your weakest link will be your pelvic floor and abdominal muscles, without doubt. Um, you know, I'm now, I'm now 41. My youngest <laughs> is just turned six. I was talking to my friend the other day who loves basketball and she's the same age. And she said she, she does basketball twice a week. And she told me the other day that about 50% of a basketball team all wear pads for the basketball. Wow. Because they're leaking. And they went back into basketball, which is great, but they didn't, majority of them didn't do the rehab. They didn't work on their pelvic floor. They didn't work on their core. And now they're putting up with, like, the, it's great that they're doing basketball, absolutely, but they shouldn't have to be just suffering in silence and leaking yes, and is. having, you know, to worry about wetting their pants during basketball. So, yeah, if you're listening today, Definitely invest into your body. Your body has produced a beautiful baby. You've done a lot to um, give your baby and now's the time to reinvest it back into your body um, yeah. so that you can set yourself up for future pregnancies, as you said, but also beyond pregnancies. We've got menopause on our doorstep. You know, then that's another time in our life where we have these issues. They spike in terms of um, the pelvic floor concerns. So, Now's the time to, whether or not your first baby, third baby, mid forties, mid twenties, now's the time to work on you because a number of times women in their fifties and sixties have said to me, oh, I wish I had done this sooner. And like, it's never too late, but that's why we're talking today. And that's why I'm, I'm so happy that we have been able to chat because if we can help just yeah. more women, just So they don't have to say when they're 50, 60, I wish I had done this sooner. Like it's just so important. Not just physically, not just, it's for every facet of our life, mental health, as we've said. Yeah, it's huge on nutrition as well. You'd be surprised, like, you know, aside from gestational diabetes, I do some other work um, around nutrition coaching and things like that. And I see so many women who are in their 40s and 50s and thinking like, yeah, I don't know what's happened. Like it's been, you know, 10 years and suddenly like I'm in this body that doesn't feel like me anymore. And, you know, I want us to be able to like cut out that kind of middle ground time and just help you be proactive in terms of feeling good all the time. There's no reason you need to just completely let everything go. Um, I want you to feel good now and good forever so that you don't Mm. find yourself in that position where you're starting from scratch. Like, oh my God, like I'm not exercising. Like I'm not eating well. I feel crap about myself. Like I don't want that for you. So be proactive and find the exercise that you love and find the food and the nutrition pattern that you love and you're sorted kind of. (laughs) Well, yeah, well, that's right. 
nutrition and exercise so much hand in so hand. important with hormone regulation, right? And hormones yep. go AWOL during pregnancy and menopause. And that's the two times when, yeah. you know, women complain of weight gain and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, if we can get our nutrition and exercise sorted, that's a huge hurdle. Yeah. Now it would be remiss of me not to ask you, tell us about your program. Where can everybody go and find more about you and what you do? Because I'm sure they're listening to this like, oh my God, I really need to care about this stuff a little bit more than I am at the moment. So tell us all about Fitness Mama and everything that you do. Oh, thanks, Helena. Um, Come and check out the podcast, the Fitness Mama podcast. It's a pregnancy, birth and recovery podcast. Um, but yeah, I've got a seven day free trial. So whether or not you're pregnant or you're wanting to become pregnant or you're in your postnatal recovery phase or your years down the track, there's really tailored workouts. It's like Netflix style. It's an app. You can pick and choose the workout depending on how you're feeling. So whether or not you're tired, achy, nauseous, energetic, mums and bubs classes, like there's a whole range, yoga. Pilates, strength, cardio. So you can pick and choose based on how you're feeling and you can do five minutes of it or you could do 30 minutes of it. Like, it, you know, you can pick and choose to help make it an easy part of your lifestyle. And those women that end up saying to me, oh, my gosh, I feel like, you know, I'm back into netball, I'm back into running, I'm back into hiking, they're the ones who have just been chipping away and that's where the app is really helpful for that. So come and do a seven-day free trial and or come and say hi to me on Instagram if you want, if you've got any questions about your particular situation. Um, I'm on Instagram at Fitness Mama. Beautiful. I'm going to put all of that into the show notes so that everybody can find you really, really easily. But thank you. And I should have asked before, but do you have any final things you wanted to say about any of this or are you feeling like we've had a good chat and that's a good oh, wrap we've totally totally covered it but um reinvest back into your body do what's easy for you and do what works for you in your lifestyle and you deserve it everyone listening today deserves it and it shouldn't be pushed to the bottom of the to do which to do list which i know is easy to do and if you're listening to this and feeling tired or or you're just finding it impossible to exercise, I totally understand. Come and send me a message. I'm here to help. Um, yeah, because this is something I think we can help support all women to do a bit more of. Yeah. My biggest tip, schedule it in. Write it down okay. in your calendar so that it is a booking with yourself. And I don't care if it's a five-minute booking. You need to schedule it in so that it actually happens. It's super important and you'll thank yourself afterwards. But thank you, Kath. I have really enjoyed this chat. It's been so nice to bring the listeners all of your beautiful information about exercise and movement in pregnancy. I'm sure they will appreciate this episode so, so much. So we appreciate you. Thank you for giving up your time to chat to me. Um, and I think we might have to get you on again one time. So keep your eyes we'll out. We'll do a reset <laughs> update. How about that? Yeah. yeah. Update in six we'll months circle time. back. <laughs> I love it. Thanks everyone. And before I sign off, remember my team and I will be putting together the show notes for this episode with all the links, including how to connect with Helena and her brilliant podcast. Also the links with the discount code for this month's podcast sponsor, Baby Jogger. And finally, if you want to come and join our free seven-day trial, the link is there too. Have a fabulous day, everyone. And I look forward to you joining me very soon for another episode of the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Mama podcast brought to you by the Fitness Mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free. So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.